Good morning, and uh, thank you for including me on the program, and thank you to the sponsors for uh, sponsoring this, uh, I think, very important event. I'm going to talk to you about the impending world oil shortage and talk about learning from the past, specifically what happened in 1973 and 1974. Before I jump into this, I'd like to make a couple of comments and what I would hope are clarifications about some things that were said yesterday. First of all, peak oil, or what I'd like to call the impending decline of world oil production, is a liquid fuels problem. It is not an energy problem in the way people often talk about it. The reason for that is that worldwide there is something like 50 to 100 trillion dollars worth of capital equipment that was built to operate on liquid fuels. There is no way we're going to change that quickly. And when fuels go into shortage and prices go up, it's a liquid fuels problem and electrification which renewables and nuclear and other sources can provide are not going to have any impact quickly. And it's extremely important that that be uh, understood. Longer term, I totally believe that we're going to electrify a lot of our technologies and we will have a better longer term future. It just won't happen quickly. Some definitions and their impl implications. Uh, first, I'm talking about here uh, prediction, which has a relatively high degree of uh, certainty associated with it. Then there is anticipation, which has a lower level of certainty. And then there is suggestion, which is something to think about. In our particular framework here, prediction. World oil production will go into decline at some future date. I have no doubt about that at all. Anticipation. Our work, in uh, particularly the group that, uh, that I'm dealing with, we believe and anticipate that world oil production will go into decline sometime in the next one to four years. A year ago, that was two to five years, and we're going to stick to our guns. The suggestion that I will make, and a good part of my presentation will tell you about, is that public reactions to the realization of the decline, the onset of the decline of world oil production will be something like what happened in 1973 and 74 and also in 1979. Here's a picture which we consider to be fact, but there's always uncertainty, so I put a question mark there. World oil production had been rising until about early 19, uh, 2004, and then it reached a plateau, and it has been on that plateau, maybe with a little bit of rise, a fluctuating plateau, during that period of time, with a relatively small uh, band of fluctuations. Our anticipation, what we think is likely to happen, is that we will stay on this plateau or very slight rise for the next one to four years, and then world oil production, total liquid fuels, will go into decline. There's two conceivable paths that I indicate here. One is a very, very small decline rate of something much, much less than 1%. If that happens, I think that societies will be able to manage that problem reasonably well. On the other hand, if we go to something of the order of 3 or 4%, that is effectively catastrophic when you work through the numbers. Our belief is that uh, we're going to hit something like 3 to 4% decline in this one to four year period. If you take production as a function of time, and there's the increase to 2004 and then the continuation, and then decline thereafter. If you take that model and you, you consider what would happen if to the date of decline, um, 
if we cut uh, production, excuse me, uh, production and demand by something like a million barrels a day, if you run through the simple numbers, it turns out to be a matter of weeks of difference for the longer period, the four-year period. So the recession that we're in, if indeed there is a reduction in, uh, in the demand and production of uh, liquid fuels worldwide, uh, it's not going to make a big difference in terms of the date of the onset. Okay, conceivable. Let's look at what happened in 1973 and 1974, and let's, I'm going to give you um, uh, quotations out of the open literature, open uh, popular media uh, during that period of time. First of all, in early to mid-1973, there were energy concerns and there was economic turmoil. We have that today. Uh, on the 21st of October, there was the uh, uh, OPEC oil embargo, and after that, we had public and government chaos that you'll see in uh, in the illustrations that I have in a few minutes. Situation in 73 and 74 from an economic standpoint is different than today, of course. We had gotten off the gold standard. They had uh, price controls in the United States on uh, oil and, uh, and natural gas. There was a lot of ignorance in government uh, then uh, about energy and energy issues. Uh, there were conflicts even back then between environment and energy development and economic uh, development. A number of those situations are clearly different today, but we aren't different. People still react something like they have over relatively long periods of time, and I think it's important to remember that. Uh, as I said, I'm going to quote a number of uh, uh, newspaper uh, uh, articles uh, for you very quickly. It's long, I don't like to read, but I'm going to have to do something like that. In order to give you a flavor of what people were thinking about then, and then I'm going to draw conclusions from that in terms of what we might expect in the future. This, uh, uh, these newspaper articles came out of uh, uh, a collection of a friend of mine, a fellow that I used to work with, who collected uh, newspaper articles and put them in a notebook over a significant period of time, and I'm very glad to uh, acknowledge his uh, contribution here. Okay, we're going to talk about then the quotations uh, that existed uh, in newspapers. Uh, the uh, uh, capitalized, excuse me, the uh, bold... Uh, quotes that you see are the headlines and uh, the unbolded are uh, what, uh, what occurred in articles. And I've got dates here and I've got the uh, various uh, sources for those people who are interested in that, but it would gum up the slides too much. Okay, in uh, March of 1973, well before the onset of the, uh, of the embargo, uh, they were concerned about uh, oil prices uh, and balance of payments, and they were concerned about that impact on inflation. The energy industry was warning, different energy, energy, in, in, energy industry then than today, they were warning people that there were problems ahead and uh, that, it could be, that it could lead to major energy uh, shortages. Uh, there were uh, uh, concerns associated with the environment that cut down on offshore drilling, and we've heard that again, of course, today recently. And there was calls for a uh, balance between uh, the environmental concerns and uh, people's way of life. The, uh, here was a, a, a quotes associated with the overhaul of the energy system. Basically, what they were talking about is a 10-year research and development program, which turns out later to have been uh, uh, implemented to bring new energy technologies to the fore so that they could be implemented. They were talking in, again, March, this is before October, of uh, uh, gasoline shortages and slowdown in, uh, in transportation in parts of the country in the United States. These are all United States, of course. President uh, uh, called for the abolishment of 14-year quotas on oil imports and called on Congress to end the uh, regulation on natural gas. They were highly regulated in those days. We don't have that problem today in most places. Uh, energy message from uh, the president um, missed the point, didn't, wasn't coherent. Politicians don't always get it right the first time. 
He talked about an energy challenge rather than an energy crisis, and that's not unreasonable for before the embargo. Farmers were having trouble getting fuel for their tractors, and their tractors are very important to uh, produce uh, uh, food, as we all well know. And uh, Congress granted President Nixon, he was the president at the time, the uh, ability to allocate fuels. He didn't use it, as it turns out. Texaco, which was a major oil company at that point, no longer exists, began to limit the amount of gasoline that they would sell to people at their service stations. And they began to close down service stations because there just wasn't enough gasoline to go around. And this was before the embargo. Congress was debating uh, uh, what was going on. They wanted to know why something like 2,000 gasoline stations, this is June now, uh, were uh, uh, being shut down and why the farmers were having trouble with not enough uh, fuel to move their tractors and do what it is they do, which is important because we all, of course, have to eat. Um, more gasoline stations uh, curtailing uh, hours. A gasoline truck in Florida was hijacked. People, even before the problem, were stealing and uh, there was cheating going on. Um, a lot of action and, uh, excuse me, a lot of talk and relatively little action. Uh, in July then, um, nationalization, talk about nationalization of the oil industry. In other words, if things aren't working right, what does government do? Government's gonna take it over because government feel that government can always handle things better, which some people may not always agree with. Of course, uh, we have a, a, an example here recently in Argentina where they've nationalized the, uh, the oil industry because of stresses even before the uh, onset of the decline. Uh, environmental movement threatened because people were in pain and they were troubled by the environmentalists pushing hard to, uh, uh, to make things cleaner at a time when there was pain. And here's a cartoon that I thought was uh, kind of uh, uh, interesting, environmentalists being part of the problem back then. I think we can expect that's probably gonna happen again. Okay, more quotes. Uh, Nixon uh, wanted to retreat from uh, clean air standards because of, because of the problem. Saudi Arabia and then other Arab states cut back on uh, oil uh, to the United States and that was in October of 1973, Europeans felt a headline that they were in a stranglehold. Uh, holiday driving in Holland, uh, excuse me, Holland uh, stopped uh, Sunday driving as uh, one means to uh, cut back on use. Canada, very close uh, ally to the United States, put a, a major tax on exports uh, to the United States. And um, as they say, as it was indicated here, the administration held on much longer than in retrospect we felt, uh, people felt that it should. Uh, they proposed, the president proposed uh, controls on energy, ration gasoline and fuel oil. He wanted authority to be able to do this, to exempt industry from environmental controls and impose taxes on ex excessive use of energy. He asked for it, he later got it, he didn't use it. Uh, West Europe, Western Europe and Japan drafted uh, crisis plans. Um, economics of war and energy indicated that there was a double-barreled inflationary effect associated with the increased cost of, uh, of fuels, and you can read through the rest of that. Uh, energy crisis was laid to laxity. Here we are in ASPO trying to warn people that there's uh, trouble coming and uh, in most cases people aren't listening in government. Uh, there's always the blame game. In this case, the White House and the oil industry were blamed. Uh, I remember back in those days, Exxon was the uh, figure of the bad guy in, uh, in all of this. Uh, people said that, look, the oil field started to decline in Texas. Uh, why didn't you pay attention? People didn't pay attention. Uh, different than today, back then, the oil executives were speaking out because they saw some very serious problems ahead and they saw their own inability to uh, be able to manage those problems and uh, 
So they uh, saw no way of getting out of the worst oil shortages in U.S. history. As you can see, the shortage uh, will reduce supplies and raise prices, because when there's shortages, then people bid up the price uh, petroleum. And down at the bottom in November, uh, headline, it's worse than we thought. More. This keeps going for a while. Experts used to say that a country couldn't afford, couldn't uh, have uh, inflation and recession at the same time, and we hear that again today, and yet it was happening back in those days. So there was a, uh, a fundamental tenet of economics that, um, in fact, uh, circumstances back then may or may not be the same as today, um, uh, indicated that you could get both simultaneously. Uh, again, in November, um, homeowners, drivers, production planners, government managers uh, were all feeling pain. The stock market got hit very hard and went into significant decline. It caught a lot of people off balance, and people who were uh, operating in Wall Street, uh, in fact, were confused and, uh, and, and chaotic in, uh, in their responses. Uh, inflationary effects and energy shortages uh, uh, led people to uh, higher interest rates and uh, to compensate for the, the difference of what was going on. In other words, you basically got out of standard everyday economics and you got into what the physicist would call uh, nonlinearities. Uh, the Defense Department spoke up and uh, demanded that it get the fuel that it needed, and uh, in the United States uh, in particular, that's likely to happen uh, elsewhere in the world, of course. They ordered the oil companies to deliver preferentially to them, and so that left, of course, less for uh, uh, us average folks. Uh, inflation spiral, again, that was happening uh, then because higher prices means the goods and services that we get, including food, which is goods, of course, are going to be higher priced because, in fact, agriculture is basically a use, it has been, of liquid fuels to uh, modernize and move things very quickly and do things differently than my grandfather, who was a farmer and who I, uh, I watched uh, till fields with a horse and, uh, and a plow when I was a youngster. Uh, administration was caught uh, unprepared. Sound like it might happen again. Uh, carpooling was pushed back in those early days. Airplanes, uh, airlines were cutting back on, uh, on daily flights and um, 1,000 indicated and 16 more coming uh, relatively soon thereafter and layoffs of people because if you're cutting back on services, obviously you have to uh, let go a number of people in order to maintain some kind of profitability. Cheating on uh, fuel was starting. Uh, they talked about uh, rationing and rationing coupons, and uh, there were already people that were uh, beginning to counterfeit uh, coupons, even though it didn't, hadn't started. Uh, General Motors laid off a large number of people. Airlines laid off, uh, cut uh, further flights. Uh, oil prices uh, threatened, to, threatened to swamp the world economy. That kind of a thing, if you think it through, is reasonably easy to understand. Hijacking of uh, gasoline, uh, again, people cheat and will cheat and uh, uh, try to take care of themselves and uh, profit from what's going on. Gasoline lines, I remember those very well because I was an adult back in those days. A number of you probably remember that. Uh, also, people tried to come early and, uh, and it didn't make any difference because a lot of people thought the same thing. Uh, Nixon administration in those days waiting longer before uh, going ahead with gasoline rationing. World economics uh, forecast uh, declines. Uh, major economies all around the world were impacted. Conferees in the Congress in the United States still didn't get an energy bill going. Again, the kind of conflict that we see uh, that uh, exists today between uh, parties, not only in the United States, but elsewhere in the world. The chairman of Amico was speaking out, and uh, they were um, uh, instituting uh, rationing in their own way with what they, they could do, and uh, they were talking about the need to uh, cut back on uh, private uh, uh, use of cars and so forth. These are the gasoline lines that I remember, and a number of you may remember uh, also from back in those days. Cartoons are always interesting and convey a lot. Uh, last gas forever. 
uh, hopelessness uh, on the part of a number of people. Okay, I've gone through quickly a lot of things. I selected what I thought were highlights out of a significant volume of newspaper uh, clippings, and I've tried to run through those for you. Let's try to extract then from that what is likely to happen when the realization occurs that the world has a liquid fuels problem. High fuel prices, of course, shortages, shortages and high prices go together, gasoline lines until something is uh, uh, done to manage things, economic slowdown, chaotic circumstances because people are caught off balance and uh, when people, any of us are caught off balance, uh, we're in chaos until we can settle out. Layoffs, service cancellations, not just service stations, but uh, uh, service stations may close, but a lot of services are going to have to be cut back because people can't move around to uh, easily or ex uh, inexpensively to uh, provide services. Anger, of course, you can understand that. Impatience, confusion, desperation on the part of a number of people. Uh, rationing, maybe by industry, but I suspect that this problem is going to be big enough that there'll be rationing by government. And if you want to read the horror stories of what rationing really involves, we have a chapter on that in our book written by uh, one of my econ economist colleagues. Inflation and high interest rates and stock market declines. It could be very serious stock market declines. Uh, conflict between environmental uh, uh, figures of merit and hopes and uh, pragmatic mitigation because we're not going to roll over. As you know, we've done work on the mitigation problem. Uh, mitigation will happen and there are going to have to be some uh, sacrifices made, not to rape the environment, of course, but uh, everything isn't going to continue to move towards a greater purity. Theft and hoarding and cheating and a darkening outlook. Okay, in conclusion, uh, George Santayana is quoted as saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And we've heard that, uh, I think all of us have heard that in different ways. My point to you is, if you haven't already thought about what's going to happen, form your own conclusions and done things to protect yourself, then you're going to get caught up in the flow and you could be hurt worse than if you take actions personally to minimize your own damage. And the question is, are you going to do that or you're not going to do that? Thank you.